Thank you for all uh, uh, taking time out. My name's uh, Michael Moore. I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon practicing in Bismarck, North Dakota. Uh, prior to coming to North Dakota 10 years ago to start a new spine program, I was in practice in the Denver area for about 10 years. I've had an interest in the sacroiliac joint since beginning practice and have acquired a fair amount of uh, experience for various reasons in the evaluation and treatment of patients with sacroiliac pain. I've done about 210 open sacroiliac fusions over the years, and I've had the opportunity at various times to uh, review the uh, results on these and report on them. What I'd like to do today is share that experience with you, and hopefully you'll find this use useful in uh, evaluating treating patients of your own with similar problems. Uh, while my experience is mainly with open arthrodesis, I believe this experience is applicable to the newer uh, minimally invasive approaches. And I'll, I'll just go into how I got interested in this to begin with. When I was in training and in residency, I kind of came away with the um, uh, notion that uh, uh, they used to think that sacroiliac joints could hurt in the old days, and they used to fuse them, and it didn't work, so we don't do them anymore. Uh, that was kind of the main line uh, uh, dogma of the time, which was in the 80s. I had one attending, however, who was trained in England. He was British, and he had a different point of view, and he actually had a few patients when I was resident that uh, he did sacral fusions on it to the extent you can follow things as a resident. I recalled them doing well. So when I got into fellowship and into practice, I started looking for these problems, and um, uh, recalled the experience from residency, and I thought, well, uh, first I'll take a look at the literature and see if I can find this information uh, that was sort of offhandedly quoted to me that uh, sacroiliac joint fusions weren't done anymore because they uh, didn't work. Uh, if you go back in the literature in the early part of the century, you'll find quite a bit written about uh, the sacroiliac joint being a source of um, uh, low back pain. And uh, you go back to the beginning of the century, Goldthwaite and Osgood talked about its association with pregnancy. Albee uh, carried out 50 dissections of uh, pelvises and cadavers and reemphasized the point that the, the sacroiliac joint was, in fact, a synovial joint, which had been described by anatomists previously. But Albee observed in 1909 that most of his colleagues thought that the joint was a synchondrosis and did not move. When you get to reports of surgical series, the main ones are Gainsland, uh, 1921, Smith, Peterson, and Rogers, 1926, and Campbell, 1927, all reporting about 80 to 90 percent success. Smith, Peterson, and Rogers reported on 26 patients, and one of these was Smith, Peterson's own wife. And I could not find any uh, articles uh, reporting on surgery that reported negative results. I also came across an uh, early article that that uh, attempted to uh, describe uh, the entity that they called sac arthrogenetic telalgia. The term obviously didn't catch on, but what they were referring to was the fact that disorders of the sacroiliac joint could um, refer pain into the lower extremity and even into the uh, foot. And um, on uh, retrospect, they could look uh, very similar to patients with herniated discs. Now, I think most people are familiar with this article, uh, Mixer and Bart, 1934, which is frequently uh, misidentified as the first article that described the herniated disc. There were descriptions of herniated disc going back to Virchow in the 1850s, and the earliest surgical report was by Dandy in 1929. Nonetheless, the article by Mixer and Barr captured the world's attention, and Subsequent to the publication of that article, it seems that most of the medical world tried to turn every back problem into a disc problem. And so if you look at the literature, between the late 1930s and the 1970s, there's almost no mention of the sacroiliac joint in orthopedic or neurosurgical literature. And as we uh, arrive at the time of my training, despite the fact that there had not been any negative press, so to speak, on sacroiliac joints, at least in the formal literature, um, recognition of the sacroiliac joint as a pain generator and certainly uh, surgery directed at it was uh, viewed with disfavor. In looking at um, uh, the articles that you could find, this one was interesting. Uh, Norman and May, writing in 1956 in a fairly obscure journal, had an article entitled Sacroiliac Conditions Simulating Intervertebral Disc Syndrome. And what they discuss in this short article is their experience seeing a number of patients who had been operated upon for uh, purported disc lesions who did not improve 
after surgery. And when they looked into the reason for this, they diagnosed these patients as having uh, sacroiliac mediated pain based on injections of a local anesthetic into the sacroiliac joint. The first surgical article that I came across wasn't until 1987, and this was by uh, Weisbrod, who's uh, German, I believe, and this is in a uh, European journal. He reported on 21 patients followed from a year to uh, a little over five years. Nine of these patients had prior spine operations. I'd like to draw your attention to that um, number because that uh, comes up frequently in a series of sacroiliac patients, uh, the issue of prior surgery and possible prior misdiagnosis. They only reported 50% good results overall. After they instituted psychological profiling, their success rate went up to 70%, which is not spectacular, but it was promising. And if you, if you look in the article at how they were diagnosing sacroiliac joint mediated pain, they did it by a provocative test using an injection technique. In other words, they attempted to pressurize the interior of the sacroiliac joint. Uh, and uh, provoke the patient's typical pain, such as you would do with a provocative discogram. Uh, most people would not endorse that as a valid method of diagnosis at this time, and that may have accounted for some of their failures. Well, as I began looking for these patients, I started operating on um, selected ones, and in 1992 at NASA, I was able to report on my first 13 patients who were treated with open arthrodesis. All of these patients had symptoms for greater than a year and had failed conservative treatment. They were all diagnosed with CT or fluoroscopically guided injection. They had to have near complete relief of their typical symptoms during the anesthetic uh, phase of that injection. Uh, intracanal pathology was excluded by other imaging studies. There were 10 female and 3 male patients, mean symptom duration 23 months. 10 of the 13 were able to identify a specific episode of trauma after which their uh, symptoms immediately began. And this was usually uh, something like a slip and fall or a lifting injury, such as uh, lifting something heavy out of the trunk of a car. It was not major uh, pelvic trauma or pelvic disruption. Six of the 13, once again, had prior lumbar spine surgery. And um, <clears throat> I don't have a complete characterization of those, but I remember that my first patient was a um, about a 24-year-old lady who had previously been an aerobics instructor. She had been involved in a motor vehicle accident in which she was a passenger, and her knee had struck the dashboard, uh, applying a posterior uh, force uh, to her uh, femur, and she had pain on the right side of her lower back since that time. Uh, when she uh, sought attention for this, someone did an MRI, thought they saw a herniated disc, did a discectomy, and she wasn't improved, and thereafter she was cycled through a number of uh, pain clinics and uh, uh, psychiatric evaluations and so on. We did a sacroiliac joint injection on her. It, it uh, completely eliminated her pain and uh, carried out a fusion and she did very well. So after that I, I got uh, pretty excited about looking for this. Um, I have recorded just in terms of physical findings in that initial series, two of 13 had a positive straight leg raise and 10 of 13 had a positive uh, Faber. I had nine excellent, two fair and two poor results. I tried to uh, discern why the uh, two patients had poor results. I thought it might be because of pseudoarthrosis, but uh, with the CT scan, I was able to demonstrate a solid arthrodesis, so I was not able to identify what the reason was. I suppose it was uh, a misdiagnosis. Uh, there was one pseudoarthrosis which was repaired and which uh, ended up doing well. This shows the operation I was doing at the time. Uh, a curvilinear incision is made centered on the posterior superior iliac spine, and it placed two or three AO cancellous screws across the joint with washers and then cut a uh, transiliac window into the synovial portion of the joint. This shows an intraoperative photograph to orient you to the left of the screen is the patient's head. Uh, to the right is their feet. They're uh, prone on chest rolls. This is the posterior superior iliac spine. I've placed two screws across the joint using uh, floral, then used a Midas Rex bone scalpel to score the outer cortex, and then used a osteotome to uh, complete the bone window, and if you do this right, you pull out a plug of bone that has uh, subchondral bone and cartilage from the iliac side of the joint, and you're looking right at the cartilage on the uh, sacral side of the joint. It, again, trying to stay out of the ligamentous portion and trying to target the uh, synovial portion. I then decorticate the base of this and excavate the uh, margins. I'd harvest some bone graft from the posterior superior iliac spine and pack in the depths of that, and then countersink the window uh, across the joint. 
this is what the post-operative uh, appearance would typically look like, and this is what a, a healed fusion uh, by that technique looks like. You can see cancellous bone spanning the uh, sacroiliac joint there. As a result of that paper, uh, it, it received um, uh, mixed reviews, to say the least, at the uh, meeting. About half the audience um, um, thought I was crazy, and, and some of them demonstrated their uh, uh, lack of knowledge about the joint by saying, well, it's a synchondrosis, and why are you fusing a synchondrosis? It doesn't move. Same problem that Albi uh, uh, encountered. The other group of uh, people responded enthusiastically because they said they had patients with sacroiliac pain, and they didn't know what to do with them. They were glad to see that there was something to do. Well, what happened is uh, I started getting referrals from around the country, so I acquired quite a bit of experience fairly uh, quickly. And uh, I was able in 1998 to report on 110 patients with a two-year minimum follow-up. Only three patients required bilateral procedures, and that is a figure that I've found to hold up fairly well. A lot of patients will have pain on both sides, but they're able to identify one uh, side as, as being the worst. And if you um, make the diagnosis, uh, fuse that side, the other side most of the time ceases to be a problem in my uh, experience. Uh, diagnosis was all by CT or fluoroscopically guided injection of a low volume, this is very important, of local anesthetic and steroid into the synovial portion of the joint. What I'm uh, doing with that injection is I'm trying to confirm the diagnosis uh, with the use of the local anesthetic, and um, I'll show you how we evaluate these injections um, a little later on. But I'm looking to see if they have pain relief during that phase. If the steroid happens to uh, relieve their symptoms over a longer term, um, fine. If not, then uh, we can talk to them about other options, including surgery. Average operative time was an hour and 15 minutes, blood loss 200 cc's. I found that in patients who had isolated sacroiliac joint pathology, meaning that they had no prior surgery and no coexistent diagnoses such as uh, spondylolisthesis or degenerative disc disease and so on, I was able to get about 90% uh, success. If they had coexistent spinal pathology, uh, success was harder to come by. It dropped to the 80-84 uh, percent rate. I had 9 percent uh, pseudoarthroses, which I wasn't happy with. Uh, eight of the 10 patients with pseudoarthrosis that I knew about were smokers. Uh, I didn't evaluate everyone with the CT uh, for pseudoarthrosis. I only evaluated uh, patients with continued symptoms. Uh, seven of these underwent repeat surgery and five ended up uh, with clinical and radiographic success. No vascular or visceral injuries, no permanent nerve damage. Now, what I was not able to comment on on the basis of uh, that experience was how common is sacroiliac pain? Because my experience was clearly biased because of the um, referrals I was getting. And um, so I was unable to comment on the true um, prevalence or incidence of this, but people have uh, looked at it. Schwarzer in April, using an uh, injection technique such as I described, um, looked at all patients referred to their diagnostic center and found that of patients with pain below L5, 30% of these were attributed to the sacroiliac joint on the basis of their injection studies. I think if they took all comers, it was like 13% of all low back pain patients. Bernard and Kirkaldi Willis reviewed 1,295 patients, and their conclusion was 22% of all low back pain was related to the sacroiliac joint. They also noted that 30% of patients with radiographic spondylolisthesis had sacroiliac pain. and uh, demonstrates that someone can have um, uh, coexistent problems or someone can have a radiogra radiographic abnormality which catches your attention but which is not necessarily the actual pain generator. Maine uh, recommended using a, a technique involving two separate injections to try and improve the precision. He concluded 18% of all low back pain is referable to the sacroiliac joint. More recent article by Sombrano and Polly. They looked at patients referred for evaluation of low back pain and uh, were trying to study how often it was related to the sacroiliac joint or the hip. They found that um, in their review, 14.5% of all patients referred to them did in fact have sacroiliac pain. So a variety of sources uh, sort of giving you a span of estimates of somewhere between 15% and 30% of low back pain is due to um, uh, sacroiliac mediated pain. That's not to say that uh, that percentage requires surgery, but uh, at least that it, it's not an uncommon uh, diagnosis or uncommon entity. 
who are the patients who has sacroiliac joint dysfunction or um, uh, sacroiliac mediated pain. In my experience and in the experience of uh, some other uh, people who have been interested in this, uh, about 70 to 80 percent of patients are post-traumatic and it's usually not a major uh, trauma such as a pelvic disruption, uh, malgaining fracture, that type of thing, although I, I have seen those. Most of the time it's something that does not sound like it should lead to a long-term problem, something like a slip and fall. Uh, de novo, or uh, if you want to call it idiopathic, uh, is another category, and post-lumbar fusion. Uh, less agreement on uh, what percentage these, re these represent, but I would like to uh, uh, focus on the post-lumbar fusion group for a second. Uh, NASA 1995, Kleiner and Weingarten reported on sacroiliac pain as a complication of spine fusion, and they reviewed uh, anterior-posterior fusions, posterior fusions, and uh, tried to relate that to uh, level of fusion and so on. They found about 9% of their anterior-posterior fusions, about 11% of their posterior fusions alone who developed uh, back pain uh, postoperatively uh, had sacroiliac-mediated uh, pain. They found an incidence of 33% in patients who were fused to L3 or above. They did not find any patients who developed sacroiliac pain unless the fusion involved the sacrum. And they also found no relation to the bone graft site. Katz, Schofferman, and Reynolds in 2003 Journal of Spinal Disorders um, reported on the sacroiliac joint as a potential cause of pain after lumbar fusion. They had 34 patients presenting with low back pain after lumbosacral fusion. The sacroiliac joint was the cause in about a third of them. Once again, they found <coughs> excuse me, no correlation with the site of bone graft harvest. So the, the trick in this, uh, I, I think most would agree, like all things in spine surgery, it's a matter of identifying the correct patient group, making the correct, correct diagnosis, and picking the right patients. So uh, what do you do to diagnose this? There are a number of physical examination maneuvers that are purported to uh, be useful in diagnosing uh, sacroiliac pain. I'll just run through these quickly as I'm sure you're familiar with them. Uh, distraction, you can uh, attempt to compress the joint, reproduce pain, Patrick's test or a favor maneuver can be done in a uh, supine position or a seated position. Uh, you can press directly on the sacrum, you can uh, apply a posteriorly directed force on a flexed hip while stabilizing the uh, sacrum and see if you can uh, reproduce the pain. Uh, there are a number of functional tests or motion tests, such as the Gillette test. You ask the patient to raise, uh, in this uh, case, the uh, right uh, lower extremity with the hip and knee in, in a high degree of flexion. And the normal response is said to be an inferior movement of the posterior superior iliac spine relative to the other side. If it does not move, that's considered to be a positive test reflecting lack of mobility. Well, there's, there's been a number of attempts to see how good these tests are, although they're handed down um, uh, in textbooks and so on as being useful in diagnosing this. It turns out when you uh, compare it with uh, something of a, um, a gold standard, if you accept an injection study as a gold standard, it's hard to correlate these very well. Dreyfus, in an article in 1996, attempted to correlate 12 tests with the results of intraarticular diagnostic block of the joint, requiring 90% relief of their typical symptoms to make the diagnosis of uh, sacroiliac joint mediated pain or sacroiliac joint dysfunction. found that none of these tests allowed you to predict with any accuracy the result of the um, injection study. And in fact, no combination of these uh, was found to be useful. Uh, others have uh, attempted similar studies and replicated these results. Uh, there's also uh, a number of um, papers that uh, will dispute this finding and uh, do things like standardized training in the test to try and reduce inter-observer uh, reli reliability. But I would just summarize uh, by saying this, the reports are mixed, but many reports and uh, my experience is that uh, there's fairly poor reliability in physical examination maneuvers uh, uh, for forecasting a, a positive uh, sacroiliac joint injection study. And we can spend more uh, time on that in the question period if you'd like. It, it bothers some people, and it bothers me as far as that goes, that there's not something that is the equivalent of a straight leg raise to diagnose uh, sacroiliac joint pathology. But if you look around other areas in medicine, 
there are lots of things that cannot be diagnosed on uh, physical exam that nonetheless are uh, real entities. Uh, cold visceral neoplasms, the pancreas, lung, colon, liver, and so on uh, can be present, can be diagnosed with a completely normal physical exam, early renal failure, many brain tumors, parasitic diseases, and so on. And the sacroiliac joint is a unique joint, both in terms of its uh, function, uh, topology, and geometry, and uh, ligamentous anatomy. So uh, I'll share with you what my uh, sort of algorithm is for deciding who to send for a diagnostic injection. I find the history and the patient's description and location of their symptoms to be the most valuable thing. About 80% of patients will have a history of uh, specific trauma. It seems to often involve a twisting injury. The pain is not in the midline. In contrast to patients with discogenic pain, who I find essentially always have pain in the midline, patients with sacroiliac joint mediated pain point directly at the posterior spirit LX spine or uh, just medial to it. <clears throat> I can't give you chapter and verse on this, but something I've noticed that if you ask about, they frequently will describe using a non-reciprocal gait and ascending stairs. In other words, they prefer to go up one step at a time, advancing uh, the good leg and bringing the symptomatic leg up afterwards. Um, they also describe pain rolling over in bed. Now, these latter two things, of course, are nonspecific, and you have to exclude hip arthritis, trochanteric bursitis, other things that might do the same thing. But um, th this is part of what I use in trying to screen people. I have everybody uh, fill out a pain diagram. And I've seen uh, these three patterns pretty commonly. Uh, the first one I call the pseudo S1 pattern because they will uh, trace out a pattern that looks very much like what you would expect someone to mark if they had uh, S1 radiculopathy uh, from an L5-S1 disc herniation. Uh, there are a handful of patients who will uh, give you a, a drawing like this, which you might immediately uh, identify as non-anatomic or a hysterical pattern, but I wouldn't throw those patients on the, on the ash heap until you've uh, taken a look at them because uh, some sacroiliac patients will have this type of pain pattern. I think it's around 4 or 5 percent. I think this is the most common uh, C where there's pain directly over the sacroiliac joint. Any of these in combination with groin pain, I believe, forecasts a, a, a positive injection study. Uh, diagnosis. Uh, if they've got pain over their sacroiliac joint, point to their posterior spine and they've got uh, plus or minus groin pain. If I have a confirmatory injection, we'll describe how that's done and interpreted in a second. And if I've excluded or identified alternative or coexistent pain generators, then I'm, I've made the diagnosis of uh, sacroiliac joint mediated pain. I require that the injection results should be uh, unequivocal. Uh, meaning the patient should not be wishy-washy about whether the anesthetic alleviated their pain. Um, I'll, I'll show you what I regard as a positive injection in a second. It also must be technically successful. I like to see a fluoroscopic view or a CT scan showing the needle in the joint in order to know that the person doing the injection had it in the correct place. How do you interpret this? Well, you do one or two low volume injections with floral or CT guidance. You have the patients keep a pain diary and we give them this sheet of paper so they fill out at specific times before and after the injection. I tell them that they should have maximal symptoms prior to the injection. If there's anything they can do to get their uh, pain up as high as they can, that will make it easier for them to discriminate uh, whether or not the injection is positive or not. Uh, they have to have 90% pain relief. By this, I mean near complete. I don't uh, calculate a percentage number or ask them for a percentage. I try and get a feel from talking to them uh, exactly uh, how much of their pain was removed. What I'm looking for is near complete. I would suggest that if you have partial relief, 50, 60, 70% relief with a technically successful sacroiliac injection, I'd recommend that you look for another pain generator. Uh, whether a facet block, medial branch block, uh, selective nerve root block. If you do discography, you might want to consider that. But um, I think you need, if you don't have uh, near complete relief, you need to look for alternative or coexistent pain generators. Uh, you also will come across some patients nowadays who have an expectation bias. They show up announcing that their diagnosis is sick reliac joint, and they've read about it, and they know you're going to send them for an injection. and uh, so there, there can be some bias due to that. If I have a patient I suspect that in, I'll tell them, you know what, we're going to do two or three injections, and I'm not going to tell you uh, what we're injecting. You have to get the patient's permission to do this, of course, 
that I tell them uh, we might inject a long-acting local anesthetic, a short-acting one, or we might inject saline. And then if their uh, pain diagram doesn't make sense, then I would uh, uh, certainly avoid operating on that patient. If they're all consistent, I think you can be fairly confident. Now, recently I've, I started using the iFuse implant for a minimally invasive approach to this. I just have two cases I'll share with you. Uh, these are um, fairly typical patients who I would have done an open arthrodesis on in the past. Uh, first lady was a 49-year-old uh, lady with two years of pain after a twisting injury. And here was her intake pain diagram, right smack dab over the posterior sphere iliac spine. And this gets me thinking about the sacroiliac joint uh, right off the bat. Uh, she did, in fact, uh, have pain and tenderness over the PSIS. She happened to have a positive Faber. Uh, here was her MRI, which shows some uh, degenerative disc disease at L4 or 5. Um, some people may have thought of discography. However, uh, because of the pain diagram and, and the history, I thought that sacroiliac joint pathology was uh, much more likely. Another marker for patients who may have sacroiliac joint pathology is someone who's been to, a, it seems like a legitimate character, who's been to a number of practitioners without a satisfactory diagnosis. So for example, this patient had been to a family doctor who had prescribed physical therapy sort of generically for low back pain. A neurologist had done the MRI diagnosis was degenerative disc disease. The neurologist mentioned in their note the sacroiliac joint, but didn't go anywhere with it. Didn't know where to send the patient, didn't know what to do with it. And I think this is just um, a knowledge deficit um, that uh, that person had. And if they had uh, uh, had some more information about it, they may have uh, followed that up because it did occur to them. Neurosurgeon diagnosed degenerative disc disease, did not recommend surgery, and chiropractor was no help. Uh, this shows a fluoroscopic view with dye outlining the joint, and this shows her pain diary. She started off with a pain level of 8, and at 30 minutes, she's down to a 0 or 2. Over the next uh, uh, 4 to 6 hours, she gets back up to a 4. She's a little better. Uh, on day two and by day three is back up to an eight. So very short, if any, uh, relief from the uh, steroid. But this, in my mind, was a, a positive uh, study. This shows her intraoperative appearance with uh, uh, the iFuse implants. This shows her follow-up. At four months, she's reporting zero to one out of 10 pain. So this is early follow-up. I keep people uh, touchdown weight-bearing on crutches for two months. So she's been ambulating for two months on that. At this point, she's happy and I'm happy, and we'll, we'll uh, uh, see if that result is durable. Uh, next patient is a 39-year-old uh, self-employed uh, gentleman, financial consultant, 15 years of right greater than left-sided low back pain. He had had extensive previous evaluations and had, in the past year, been diagnosed with uh, sacroiliac joint mediated, mediated pain at a pain center. He had had repeated uh, corticosteroid injections with no long-term improvement, and he had also undergone a recent radiofrequency denervation uh, without significant improvement. This shows his plane films. You notice there might be a suspicious area there in the PARS. Uh, this shows his MRI, normal disc hydration at all levels. And just to make things interesting, he did have a unilateral uh, PARS defect. Now, this had been uh, injected uh, multiple times, but I didn't have any fluoroscopic views that demonstrated that, so I sent him for another one because I wanted to be absolutely sure that this was not the uh, uh, culprit, and he had no relief with that. He had had uh, um, significant relief for the duration of local anesthetic with multiple sacroiliac joint injections, so my conclusion was he did, in fact, uh, have pain arising from the sacroiliac joint. I recommend getting a CT on all these patients that uh, you're considering or planning surgery on. There's a great deal of uh, variability in the anatomy of the joint between individuals and also in a particular individual between the right and left sides. I have not been able to identify any features that mark a painful joint um, looking at these other than uh, the relatively unusual case where you see extensive degeneration on one side and none on the other. Um, he has a fairly planar joint and I'll just show you um, a study to contrast with that. This shows the first patient and she this is higher up in the joint but you know she's got uh, what is a anatomic variation, which she's got this excavated area in the sacrum, which shows up both on the um, transverse views and the uh, sagittal view. And the importance of this is that if you place an implant uh, across at this level and seat it to this 
area here on all your intraoperative fluoroscopic views, it will look like it's well into the uh, sacrum, uh, but in fact, you're not capturing any bone at all. Um, and it's good to know this uh, going going ahead in surgery. You can see she has a similar finding on the other side. And there are all types of anatomic variations like this. Uh, you also get information on how uh, thick the ileum is, uh, which can be useful. Uh, so this shows the, the male patient's uh, interoperative uh, lateral. He had a fairly short joint, and his sacrum got quite narrow uh, down inferiorly here. So I elected to place a uh, smaller implant for a third implant. Uh, he is a, a little over three months now post-op, and his only complaint is pain on the contralateral side. He's not having any pain on the side that we operated on. He's actually requesting a fusion uh, on the contralateral side, but he's not even been ambulating a month. I told him we'll treat that conservatively. We'll see how you feel in six months. If you're happy with the site we did and the other side still hurts and hasn't responded to treatment, then uh, we'll discuss it. I was asked to comment on uh, how do you keep patients from disappearing into what I call injection world because some of the interventional um, uh, pain people have uh, a lot of ideas on how to treat this without uh, um, it was some justification to be fair, but um, when these things repeatedly fail, I don't think it makes sense to have people continue with them and um, sometimes people will disappear into this uh, a uh, group where repeated and repeated and repeated corticosteroid injections are carried out. There's prolotherapy, radiofrequency, denervations, neuroaugmentation, spinal cord stimulators. Uh, what I do uh, to kind of tr keep track of these patients is I will order a specific, a specific study and then I'll have them follow up with me in a month or something and that way I can review the results rather than just referring them to the pain clinic for a um, uh, trial of conservative therapy or treatment, which may go on for a long, long time, uh, I'm able to get them back and discuss uh, what happened with the injection. If uh, they did have substantial relief with a steroid injection, then great, uh, continue that if that continues to work. Another way to keep track of these patients is do the injections yourself. This requires you to go take a, uh, a course, but it's not too hard to learn how to do. Some joints are uh, kind of difficult to get into, but most aren't, and uh, that's another option. Finally, if you find yourself in a debate with um, some of your pain colleagues on whether uh, surgery is a, a legitimate consideration for these patients, this is a recent textbook uh, edited by Curtis Slipman, who's a physiatrist at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, it's uh, over 120 chapters, a uh, uh, big, thorough uh, discussion of uh, all aspects of interventional uh, spine treatment, and he asked me to write the chapter on surgery for sacroiliac joint syndrome. So. Your pain colleagues probably have this book on their shelf, and uh, if you need to, you can re refer them to that chapter for more information.